All right, well, we're so glad you're here today. I, wa- I want to do something. I was reminded this morning that, um, thank you, sir, that, that school is starting back. So I want to do something. I would like for all of our teachers, if you're online, you can just stand up where you're at, and, and all of our students to stand up. We're going to pray over them. Let, let's just pray over all of our teachers that are uh, going into the school, have the opportunity to teach these kids, and, and for all of our students as well. God, I just pray right now, Lord, we lift up every teacher here this morning in Jesus' name. God, I pray that you would give them wisdom and discretion and discernment, Lord. Give them the ability to teach all of these students they're working with every day, God. We just pray that you would bless them, that you would prosper them, that you would guard them. Lord, all of our students here, God, I just pray that, that you would bring good friends, good, a good peer group, uh, where they're going, God, and, and that you would just watch over them and, Lord, just protect their minds from things that would be harmful. And, Lord, even, even with the COVID pandemic and all these different things, God, I pray you're protecting each and every one of our students and each and every one of our teachers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. The, the students can be dismissed to go on out there and go to their service. And, uh, well, we are so glad that you're here. Uh, we're thankful to everyone joining us online, in line, in person, I'm sorry. Uh, I think that something special happens when we join together. Also appreciate for everyone watching online and we would love to have you when and if that opportunity comes. Uh, I want I have one more announcement that I want to talk about real quick. So as, as many of you know, Ms. Ms. Joanne came on our pastoral staff several weeks ago, Ms. Joanne Green. And... Um, <laughs> So one of the things is we're putting her over, over our prayer ministry. And so, um, you know, every week we have people upstairs in the upper room, class 202, praying before service. And she just wants to extend that to anyone from 8.30 to 9.30 every Sunday. She'll be up there leading prayer. It's a time of fellowship, a time of prayer. If you want to learn how to pray, that's a great place to be. Uh, she, calls, she says it's going to be the hour of power. So if you want an hour of power... Uh, you can do, start doing that. And, um, I, you know, sometimes I always like the church to kind of just to know, um, you know, kind of what goes on the internal workings of, of, of the church and, and things like that. And, um, you know, when Ms. Joanne came on staff, uh, she, so the first week she's bringing this cart with all this stuff up to her office, you know. And so my son Terry said, are you intimidated? I said, not at all. Not at all. Tracy's been threatening to redo my office for years, man. I'm holding out. I'm, it's a war room. I go to war, right? I'm in a war room. Miss Joanne also wins the best dressed, and Terry and I are not trying to win that either. We just concede to her. But we're happy to have her. We're glad to have her. And, um, and I, we're just expecting great things. We're, we're just expecting great things for our church. Uh, we just believe um, great things are happening. And I want to also thank you. You know, when, when we started services back, we had lost about 60% of our volunteers. And we're up to about 90% now. So we're, we're gaining, we're gaining. And... Um, the one place we're still a little bit low in is with our younger children's class. If you would like to teach a toddler class once a month, a preschool class, once every four or five weeks, um, we, sh- we sure could use you with that. Well, let's ask God to help us this morning. God, help us with your word. It's your word. It's life breathing to us. It's your blueprint for life. You have laid out in your word everything we need to know and to follow to be successful. So God, I pray this morning as we open your word, God, that, that the, the words would leap off the pages and into our hearts, God. Lord, help me to communicate in a way that would honor you. Lord, help everyone here just to get the message that we're trying to convey today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We are, we're finishing up a series today called Paradox. So let's begin by defining the word paradox if you haven't been with us. A paradox, if you look it up in Merriam-Webster Dictionary, it just says it's, it's an assertion or sentiment seemingly contradictory or opposed to common sense, but is true. It's a statement that appears to be illogical, even absurd, yet it's true. 
So here's, here's where the problem is in the Christian life. The Christian life, the whole Christian life is a paradox. All of the major spiritual principles that we need to obey, that we need to have in our, in our lives, they're, they, um, they're, they're a paradox. You know, we've talked about some of them, the, the paradox of humility, that the way up, the way to be exalted is the life of humility and, and by lowering yourself and low, losing your pride, lowering your expectations. And we've, we've talked about the paradox of simplicity, that less is more. And, you know, the world tells us, though, you know, more is more. I know a lot of people who have more and still aren't happy, right? Less is more. And, um, you know, the paradox of sowing and reaping, the more you give, the more you receive. Last week we talked about the paradox of faith. If you can see it, you can have it. All these messages are online. They're on our website. If you miss one, you can go back and watch it. If you want to watch again, you can do that. And so today's paradox is actually something that I, I, I don't think that I've ever taught on, and I'm excited about this, and I hope it blesses you, but today's paradox is this, don't be in a hurry to win. Don't be in a hurry to win. The paradox of process. The paradox of process. A few years ago, I was watching uh, my San Antonio Spurs as they were going for yet another title. Anyway, we just lost half the congregation. Hey, we, I pray for the Rockets, you know. We pray, you know. God does not care about sports. It doesn't matter which team you root for. Don't pray for your team to win. God doesn't care, right? And, um, I mean, you can still pray if you want to. But anyway, I was watching, and so uh, I was in the playoffs, and they called a timeout, and legendary coach Greg Popovich, he told his team this. They had the mic, the cameras on there. He told his team, don't be in a hurry to win. He said, it's a seven-game series. We don't have to win every five-minute stretch of the game. And, and what, he, what he was saying, you know, I found this statement very intriguing. And I'm like, hey, I'm going to use that some, one day. I just don't know how. But he wasn't overly concerned with losing one game or losing uh, the first half of a game. He was concerned that his team was not buying into the plan that they had, the process they had, you know, to, to win the series. And they had devised a seven-game strategy. If we do this for seven games, we're going to come out on top. And so he was more concerned, uh, you know, uh, uh, about that. He expected lo to lose some games, but he felt very strongly, man, if we can follow the plan, if, if I can get my team to buy into the process that we've laid out, we have a good chance of, of being successful. And uh, eventually re to reach their goal of becoming world champs yet again. Anyway, the, so the statement, don't be in a hurry to win, it really caught, it really caught my attention. And I started, started thinking about the ramifications of that. Because you know what I think? I talk to hundreds of people. Every week I'm talking to hundreds of people. People, we are in a hurry to win. Our culture has taught us you need to be in a hurry to win. You, do, you know, you, everything's hurry. I mean, we got companies, we got Speedo, we got FedEx, and we have all these companies, uh, you know, that deliver overnight. But this statement, even though it seems illogical, is true. See, everyone wants to be successful, and the reason we're in a hurry to be successful is because no one likes, no one enjoys the highs and lows, the ups and downs of the process. But that's what life is, is a series of ups and downs, highs and lows. It's a process of God getting us to where he wants us to be. And yet this statement is true in every area of our lives. I want you to think about this. Hopefully you think about it this week, but there's not an area of your life that doesn't involve a process for you being successful. There's not one area of your life. And yet, we don't think about what is the process to reach success? What is the process to improve myself you know, in this area of my life, we just want the end result. And so the paradox of the, of the, of the uh, process says this. If we can figure out what the process is to be successful in this area, and we follow it step by step by step, we have a 100% chance of reaching success. I mean, it, it's, it's not foggy, but we have to follow the process. Let's think about some areas of our life. If you want to be successful, Financially, how many of you want to be successful financially? I'm sure 
Okay, some people like being in poverty, but most people, most people, they want to be successful financially, right? Well, there's a, there's a process. It's pretty simple. The Bible lays out several things that you actually, you have to spend less than you make. And you have to do that consistently, right? I mean, that's the, the process is a, a process of consistency. If you want to have a healthy marriage, hey, it's not hard. It's really not. It's a process. A couple has to learn to communicate. They have to learn to have proper intimacy in their marriage. They, they have to learn that they both have to be selfless. It works better if it's both, right? I mean, but there's some things you can do in the process of, of developing a, a good marriage. If, if you want to raise good kids, you say, man, I want to raise healthy, well-adjusted kids. There's a process to that. And the process is you have to put certain material in them so that when they leave home, they're able to be successful. They're able to stand on their own, them, them and God. It, it really goes to every area. If you want to be a mechanical engineer, if someone tells me, hey, I want to be a mechanical engineer, I say, okay, well, here's what you've got to do. You've got to go to college and get a degree in mechanical engineering. There are certain classes that you have to take. And then when you get close to graduation, they're going to put you, you have to go do an internship with a company and learn how to be a mechanical engineer. Then you graduate, you apply for a job, and you get it. I mean, you can't, you can't go and take music classes and hope you get a job in mechanical engineering. There's, there's a process for it. And, and I hope you're beginning to think because in every area of your life, if, a, if an area of your life's not going well, it's because you, you, you haven't been following the process. And see, that's the problem. Sometimes we don't know what the process is. And that's why I strongly encourage you to get mentors. Get somebody ahead of you in life that is successful in an area that you want to be and say, how do I do this? How can I accomplish this? Because if you learn what the process is, you can be successful. You can change your life. And many years ago when I was a youth pastor at Family Life Church in Lafayette, I had a young man that showed a lot of promise and he just loved the Lord and, and he wanted to be a youth pastor. And he was 18 years old and, and, and um, so he asked me if I would mentor him. So I said, sure, I'll do that. And in the youth ministry, the college ministry was just exploding. So the church actually hired him to be my, to be my intern. And I was trying to show him the ropes of being a youth pastor, showing him the ropes of ministry, but all he wanted to do was preach. That's all he wanted to do. And so he said, can I speak at Youth on Wednesday? I'm like, no. No, you can't do that. But, you know, we have a Christian school, and they have chapels, you know, during the week. I'll let, I'll, let's start with the chapel. Let's start with the chapel. And so, and so he was preparing his message. Just say, hey, it's going to be, you need to speak 25, 30 minutes. They had worship and, and you speak 25 or 30 minutes. And, and I said, hey, would you like me to help you prepare your message? What do you think he said? He said, no, right? I'm called from God. I'll be fine. Okay, called by God. No? I've met a lot of called by gods that are in trouble, right? And so... The big day came, and I was sitting in the back, and he spoke a roaring five minutes. He had a couple of quotes, and he just kept saying them. And he looked back at me, and I just put my head down. <laughs> come on, called of God. Come on now. Come on. And uh, let him, it got a little awkward. Then I went up there, and I helped him out and kind of saved him. And, and I talked to him later. I'm like, look, you do have a call in your life, but you're green. You don't really know anything. You got to let me help you. You got to let me help you. And he did. He went on and became a youth pastor. Then he started church. He's pastoring. He's pastoring today. But instead of worrying about the time frame to reach your dreams and goals, we have to concern ourselves with the process of reaching our dreams and goals. Again, if we understand the process and if we're willing to do the work and go through the process, uh, we have a 100% chance of improving areas of, of our lives. And, and so, again, this, and you can think about this this week. I hope you contemplate my messages later this week and, and uh, think about this. This morning, I want to focus on reaching, on the process for reaching spiritual maturity. We, have, we have, really have an issue in the church in America, maybe worldwide, but mostly in America, where a lot of people who love the Lord, they're not, they're not reaching maturity. 
they're, they get saved and they're going to heaven and they love the Lord, but they're not growing like God wants them to. And because they don't do that, they don't end up fulfilling or reaching their full potential. In the Bible, God, God has outlined a four-step process to reach spiritual maturity. And it's the same for me and it's the same for you. Here at Family Life, we call this a spiritual journey. So God in the Bible, 13 times, you can find this 13 times in different passages all the way from Exodus to Colossians. It, they, the, the wording may vary a little bit, but 13 times that I found this spiritual journey, journey mentioned. And so our spiritual journey, it consists of four, four different steps. And I'm going to walk you through these. And, and this is what, uh, this is a good intro to family life because this is everything that family life is doing every time we start something, every time we have a Bible study, every time we have a conference. It is to, it is to identify and help people take these steps in the journey. Uh, one thing about the spiritual journey is these steps have to be taken in order. You can't skip down to number three or four. You've got to start with number one. Our spiritual journey, there's four steps. First of all, God says this, I want people to know me, so know God. Second of all, I want people to let me heal all the junk in their life, all the hurts, all the habits, all the hang-ups, all the, all the rejection, all that, so they can really be free to serve me. Third is I want people to discover the purpose I have for them in life. And number four, finally, after they know God, they find freedom, they just start discovering their purpose, then he wants them to make a difference. He wants all of us to make a difference. He wants you to make a difference at your job. He wants you to make a difference in your neighborhood. He wants you to make a difference in your family. He wants family life to make a difference around the world, and we are. And we are. These four steps. So let me walk through these, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read, show you this formula, and, and we're going to start it in Exodus chapter 6. In Exodus 6, verse 2 through 8, uh, this passage has all of these ingredients in it, and we're going to talk about that, and hopefully I will encourage you and inspire you this morning. God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. That word God Almighty there, God All-Powerful, is the word El Shaddai. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself fully known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan where they resided as foreigners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites whom the Egyptians are enslaving and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. And I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians, and I will bring you to the land I swore with, uplifted, with an uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. So let, let's talk about this. The, the very first step of the spiritual journey is you have to actually meet God. You have to have a relationship with God. And, and what, I, what I noticed here in this verse, he says this, God's, God said, um, I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, that's El Shaddai. But to you, I am going to reveal my name, the Lord. Dude, dude, this is incredible because Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob God would come down and speak to them. He had a covenant with them. They, they loved him. He loved them. But what, what it says is there's, a, there's a, a continual revelation of God. And that we, we said he appeared to them as God Almighty or El Shaddai. Shaddai, uh, it, sir, it derives from the word referring to a woman's breast. Shad, and it literally means the many-breasted one. And it denotes God as, as a provider, a God a, as a supplier, as a nourisher, satisfying his people with, of their needs, just as a mother supplies the needs of a newborn baby. 
Shaddai is also related to the Hebrew word Shaddad, which means to overpower or destroy, refer, referring to God's absolute power. So this describes God as the one who triumphs over every obstacle and in all opposition. So used together, El Shaddai is usually translated Lord God Almighty, the God who is all-powerful, the God who is an all-sufficient sustainer. So that's how Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob, that's how they saw God. He's absolutely powerful, and he is absolutely able to provide every need. And so that's parts of the nature and the character of God. I find this very interesting that when God goes to the children of Israel, what he says to them, he says, but, but by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself fully known to them. And, and that, that word, the Lord, if you go back to Exodus 3.14, it's, it's the, the I am statement. When uh, Moses is saying, okay, God, what if I go and tell them that God wants to deliver you? He's going to use me to help deliver you out of Egypt. What if they won't listen? Or, or what if they ask me, well, what is the name of the God? What do you want me to say? And God said to Moses, tell them I am who I am. And this is what you are to say to the Israelites, that I am has sent me to you. And of course, I am, I am who I am. It can also be translated I will be what I will be. And uh, so you, you n notice there's just, there's just a personal ingredient. So Abraham, Isaac, and, a and Jacob, they had a covenant with God. And they knew God as provider. They knew God as sustainer. They knew God as, as all-powerful. But when he comes to Israelites, he said, but I never fully revealed my name as Lord, as the I am. But I am going to reveal that to you. So, so, so we see there's just a deeper a fuller relationship that God wanted with the nation of Israel than he had with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then in verse 7, he goes on to say this, I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. So that there, there's, there's a personal nature. There's an intimate nature when God was revealing himself to the children of Israel. And, and part of it was because they were coming out of, out of a slave culture. They had been enslaved for hundreds of years. And he's like, man, I've got to shake the dust off. I've got to shake all that stuff off of from the slavery. And they have to know who I am. What's very interesting is if you follow the story in Exodus, God takes the children of Israel about, about three months, they come to Mount Sinai. And they stay at Mount Sinai for a full year. And if you read the story there, uh, God spoke to them verbally. They heard the voice of God. Uh, they, they, the mountain shook as like it was a, an earthquake and it was, it was on fire. And, and during, during that period of a year, God was just speaking to them. God was revealing things to them. And, you know, some people say, oh, I don't like the law. I don't like, you know, the law is confusing. God gave them the law. The law has three forms. First of all, there is a moral law. We call that the Ten Commandments. Second of all, there was a civil law. If you read through Exodus, it told the nation of Israel how they were to live, and he gave them laws for civil obedience. If you did this, there were consequences. This is how you're supposed to live with people and, and how you're supposed to treat people. As a matter of fact, most, most of the laws that God gave are, are, are our laws today. There may be different consequences, but the same things that were wrong then are the same things that, that, that are wrong now. And the third thing, though, he gave them a ceremonial law. The ceremonial law was how to worship, and this was before Jesus so they had to sacrifice, there had to be a sacrifice of blood to cover, make atonement for the sin. So wait, when he was, he didn't just keep him at Mount Sinai for a year because he's like, well, I think they should camp out for a year. He kept them there and every day he's consistently talking to them and, and teaching Moses how to teach them about, about me and, and, and to receive these things. Unfortunately, Every, everything that God did to make himself known to them didn't sink in. And so three months after they left Mount Sinai, they came to a place called Kadesh Barnea, and God wanted them to go in the promised land. 
And all of them but a few people refused to go in. So that whole generation died off in the desert and God raised up their children to go in the promised land. But the reason, the whole reason that they were scared to go in the promised land is because they still did not really have a personal intimate relationship with God. I'll give you an illustration. Some of you, growing up, you had parents and you had, bad, you had a rough relationship with your parents. And it, even if your parents promised you something, you didn't believe it. Because you never saw fruit of that. And here God came down as their father. He got them out of Egypt. He's teaching them things. He's taking them on a journey. But when it came down, and they were, you know, most of the time they were like, yeah, 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 we, we, we agree with your covenant. And half the time they didn't obey, but oh, we agree. But when it came down to, are they going to obey or not? They didn't. And they didn't obey because they didn't trust God. They just didn't trust him. And, and the, the things that he was trying to do didn't, didn't stick in. So the first step in our spiritual journey the process starts with knowing God personally and intimately. It's not enough to know about God. There's a lot of people that know about God. You know, oh, the man upstairs or, you know. There's a lot of people who believe certain aspects of Christianity, but they just, they don't know God. If they knew the loving nature of God, if they knew, if they understood how much God loved them, how much God cared about them, how he has done everything in his power, to make a way for us to come to him. It would change, it would change their relationship. So Christianity, it's not about facts, figures, and truths. But it's about personalizing our relationship with God. Uh, this is also found, this, this journey is found in Ephesians. And, and he said, Paul says, I, I, I want you to know. I want you to know God. That word to know there is the word, the Greek word epinosis, and it means to know somebody personally, intimately. See, all the time we're, we're saying, oh, we, we think we know people. How many of you thought you knew somebody and then you see them on the news? <laughs> Holy smokes, man, what was that about? No, we don't know people. We don't know people that are on the news, celebrities, people that are, far, we, we don't know what they're really like. And a lot of people, that's, that's how they know God. It's at a distance. It's facts. It's figures. And God's saying, look, I sent Jesus because I want to blow your life up. I want to blow your life up. Let Jesus come in. Let him revolutionize your life. Because when you know him personally, it will change your outlook on life. And so again, a lot of the times, I'm telling you, this is true for everyone here, everyone watching online. If you don't obey a command in the Bible, it's because you don't trust God. It is a trust issue. If you trusted that God would do his part when you obey and do your part, we would absolutely do it. So it comes down to a lack of relationship. Not so much a lack of love for God, it's a lack of relationship. So this week I had an interesting thing happen. So we're, we are, um, we're redoing our cafe upstairs. If y'all have never gone up there and visited that, it's, we have coffee and all kinds of stuff up there. But uh, on September 12th in September, we're starting, we're starting another service. It's going to be an unplugged service on Sunday evening. And it's just going to be around coffee and a cafe and acoustical worship and stuff like that. So anyway, we've been talking about this and Tracy's like, man, we, we need to redo our cafe because we need to make it more, more homey wasn't the word she used, more fellowship oriented. So, um, you know, it's going to be really nice. So here's the part, part of the story. So she texts, I'm up here at the church, she texts me one day and she's like, hey, can I order stuff for the cafe? I said, yeah, that sounds good, send me a budget. <laughs> so I came home that night and her and Trinity are showing me the couches and the tables and the accessories they've ordered. And um, I said, I thought you were gonna send me a budget. She's like, oh, I'm under budget. So we got an imaginary, we got an imaginary budget floating around. <laughs> But she is under that imaginary, she's under it, I'm telling you. So, now this didn't cause an argument in our house, it, was, it wasn't a problem. And you know why? Because Tracy knows me so well. 
We have known each other since we were 12 years old. We've been married for 31 years. She knows me so well. And we had talked a little bit briefly about, you know, uh, numbers or whatever. But it was nothing on, there was nothing on paper. We didn't have to write a covenant that this was with a budget. But she knew me. She knows me. Therefore, she just took the liberty to do what she wanted to do, right? Within, within that frame of reference. So I'm actually kind of excited about this. Every time I walk somewhere in the building, I see a price tag. <laughs> when I go up in the cafe and I'm eating kolaches and donuts, I have absolutely no, no idea how much money was spent, right? And so maybe it'd be a liberating moment for me. But hey, but, but let's take it a step further. Even though... We have known each other for so long, and I know what she's thinking, and she knows what I'm thinking. Every once in a while, we pull a surprise on each other. Every once in a while. Our, our kids are all grown, and they're doing their own thing now. So, um, so Tracy, she said, um, I was talking to her one time, I said, hey, can I tell you something? But I'm kind of scared to tell you this, but I want to tell you something. Can I, can I tell you something? Sure. Okay, you promise you won't get mad? That's when you know you're in trouble. You know you're in trouble. You prom- I'm like, hey, you know, Tracy's a very good cook. She's a very good cook. But I say, hey, you know this one meal you cook? I said, yeah, so that's not really my favorite. <laughs> now, we've married 31 years. I've never complained about food. I've eaten everything. And, I, and, and sometimes she, when we're first married, she cooks them and said, hey, I don't think it's very good. I'm like, hey, it's a hot meal. I was in the military, and I, you go out there, a hot meal is a hot meal, right? And um, she said, um, you don't like that? I've been cooking that for, you know, for years. I'm like, no, no, it's okay, and the kids really like it. But if it's just me and you now, like, you got, I can write down a hundred things, you know? And she, so, I mean, for two days. We go to bed, she's like, I can't believe you didn't tell me you didn't like that. No, I like it. It's okay. It's okay. But it's not, I didn't say, it's not great is what I'm thinking, right? Uh, you cook some great things. Then a few weeks later, I don't know, I had this epiphany when our, when our kids aren't eating with us anymore. I'm like, hey, we you know the store, you know, can you get the, you know, the Doritos, can you get the blue, the blue package? What's that, Fiesta? Fiesta or something like that? Cool Ranch, oh yeah. I said, that's my favorite kind of Doritos. She said, I've known you for 37 years. I've never seen you eat the Cool Ranch Doritos. I'm like, why eat them when you're not around? Because I like them. <laughs> but, you know, you're in a family. She gets what the, what the kids get. So here, here's, here's my whole point about this. Don't ever think that you know everything about God and that your relationship is so good that it can't grow. Because it can. And see, what we saw here is a progressive revelation of God to his people. He, he, he spoke to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he said, listen, I'm El Shaddai. I'm all powerful. I'm your sustainer. I'm your provider. But with the Israelites, hey, I'm going to make it more personal with you. You're going to know, know me by my name, the Lord, the I am. And, and so, again, our relationship. So it starts with our relationship with God. And, and sure, if you've never given your life to the Lord, that's the starting point of your journey, to give your life to the Lord. But I'm telling you, the more you get to know God and understand how much he loves you, how much he understand, how much he cares about you, and how much when you go out on a limb for him, he will never let you down. When you get that revelation, you won't be scared to step out and do things for him. That's an incredible revelation. We got millions of people going to church ever when it's convenient or whatever, and it's almost like a duty. No, when we know God, we start doing things out of a relationship, not out of an obligation. And that, that's a game changer for us. Number two, he said uh, we need to find freedom. Listen to what he says. He says, therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians, and I will free you from being slaves to them. I'm going to take you out of slavery. I'm going to make you a free nation. And Egypt always, always represents, you know, sin going down to Egypt. And, and so in our lives, in our lives, it's very important that God doesn't just want us to be saved. See, there's a lot of Christians who they've given their life to the Lord, they're going to heaven, but their lives are very messed up. 
And it affects all their relationships. It affects their marriage. It affects, their, it affects everything about them. And their thought is, well, when I get to heaven, you know, I'm going to get a glorified body. God's going to heal me. Yes, he is. But he would like for you to be free on earth so you can do some work for him and so you can be a blessing to the people around you. So the nation of Israel, they had been under Egyptian rule for 400 years. They had been living as slaves and they had developed a mentality that revolved around bondage and slavery. Even though God delivered them from slavery, slavery, they were still living as slaves. And if you read the journey, read their journey to the promised land, every time life got difficult, there wasn't enough water, there wasn't enough food, there was an army coming against them, they always reverted to, e to Egypt and being slaves. Every time. Every time. And God had just brought them out of Egypt. He had devastated Egypt. And they're going over here and they run into a problem. And I mean, they would say things like this. Oh, that we were back in Egypt. Was it because there weren't enough graves in Egypt that you brought us out here in the desert to die? Oh, remember, remember Egypt. Remember we sat around pots of meat and all these vegetables, leeks, melons, cucumbers. I mean, in their mind, they're thinking that 400 years of slavery was a buffet. They just went through the buffet line every day. The golden corral every day. Go do a little bit of work and then just the golden. No, they were, they were in bondage. They were in slavery. They were beat by taskmasters. They were treated horribly. Even though God delivered them, they're going, but every time something got tough, it always went back to Egypt being where they were at. And let me tell you something. If you don't allow God to heal you of whatever's in your past, and I'm telling you, you may have had some terrible things done to you. You may have been abused sexually as a child. You may have gone through verbal abuse, physical abuse. You may have undergone tremendous rejection. You may, uh, you may be tremendously insecure right now. You may have been cheated on. You may have been betrayed. It doesn't matter what it is. If you don't allow God to heal that in your life, what will happen is this. Every time life gets tough, you will revert back to that. It will always be about that day when that person molested you. It will always be about your first wife who left. It will always go back to that. That's why God wants us to find freedom because he wants us to move forward and not look back in the rearview mirror anymore. And you can't do that. You can't do that unless you let God to heal you. And listen, I... Listen, I'm all, I love, I have friends that are professional counselors and therapists, and I'm all about that. But I'm telling you, God can do something in your heart in a short amount of time that therapy can't do in 10 years. I'm telling you that right now. And so to find freedom, what God's saying is, hey, I want, I want to free you from the bondage of slavery, whatever it is, it's different things, uh, you know, to, to different people. So how, how does God bring about freedom in your life? You know, sometimes, sometimes, usually we have multiple bondages in our life. And a lot of times, it's instantaneous. Like maybe you came to a place, you're like, I had one friend, he got saved and he, he smoked. I mean, he smoked cigarettes, he smoked two packs a day. And the day he, he went to church, he walked down the aisle, he gave his life to the Lord, he never smoked again, never, never cared to, never had a thought about it. He was just delivered. But usually... How God heals us, there's a process that he takes us to. And it may be a slow, it may be an, a, a lot of work and, and everything to get through. But you know what it always revolves around? It always revolves around people and relationships. And you know, that's why, we, that's why we have small groups. That's why we have Bible studies. That's why we have Celebrate Recovery every Sunday night. That's why we have Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace. We offer all these things and it's, we don't offer them because we don't have anything else to do. We offer them because if, if you get in tune and go along with some people that are struggling with the same things you are, it's a tremendous help. Amen. See, a lot of people are scared to go to a small group because they don't want anyone to get to know them because if they get to know them, they'll see they have problems. And one, one person I encouraged him to go to a small group and he came back to me and said, Pastor, I love this small group. They're more messed up than me. <laughs> well, there you go. You're welcome. Welcome to family life right there. We got a bunch of messed up. No, but you know what I'm saying? It's like sometimes we get this mentality that 
I'm the only one with problems. And that's not true. And a lot of people that you see that don't have problems is because they allowed God to come in and just touch that area, to heal that area, to restore that area. Number three, so know God, get to know God, find freedom, let God come and heal the hurts and wounds in your life. The third thing is to discover purpose, discover your purpose. He said this, God said, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. That's how he brought the Egypt, uh, Israel out of Egypt. The word redeem, it means to gain or regain possession of something that you once had and there's always a payment involved. And of course, the ultimate, the final redemption was when God, what? He sent his son to us. Once and done, right? And so he, he redeemed people. God tells the nation of Israel that I'm redeeming you out of slavery in Egypt so that you can fulfill my purpose on this earth. I'm going to say something right here. In America, we have a wrong perspective about purpose in America. We have a wrong perspective. You know, there's, there's conferences on, come to this conference and you'll find your purpose in life. Or there's, there's probably a hundred books on, find your purpose in life. You don't need a book and you don't need a conference. Well, then tell me how to do it, right? No. Um, see, we, in America, we think is our purpose as something we do, an activity or an occupation, that's not, that, that's not your purpose, it's what you do. And maybe it's how you make a living. Purpose has to do with who you are and who you belong to. That's what, you, that's what purpose is. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Everyone knows 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The new creation has come, the old is gone, and, and now the new is here. All this is from God who who reconciled us to himself through Christ, this is verse 18 through 20, and gave us a ministry of reconciliation, that God was recon reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though he, God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. I read that one time and a guy told me, well, I don't want the ministry of reconciliation. I'm like, well, do you want to be saved? Well, yeah, I want to be saved. I don't want to go to hell. I just don't want to help anybody else. He didn't say that, but I led him to that, you know, I helped him understand that. So, I mean, think about it. So what, what, what is our purpose? Our purpose is to reveal God to the world. That's our purpose. In your marriage, I'm supposed to reveal God to Tracy. I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to be that way to my kids, you know, to the friends. And, and, and so again, it's not so much about what you do. Your purpose is that wherever God plants you, you just start being a blessing to people. You start helping people. You start encouraging people. You start revealing God to other people. Number four is to make a difference. And here's the bottom line. All of us want to make a difference. No, no one wants to be on their deathbed. No one wants to be at the end of their life and have regrets about all the things that they failed to do, all of their unfulfilled or untapped potential. None of us want to be there. We all want to make a difference, but here's the key. The only way you can make a true difference in your life is, first of all, if you know God and his spirit is within you. Number two, you let him heal you from the things that are going to hinder you from making a difference. And you discover your purpose, then you start to make a difference. So, this is the process that God uses to take us from where we're at to where he wants us to be. It starts with a relationship, and then it's allowing God to heal our hurts, our wounds, our habits, our dark places, the places you don't want others to know about. And, and once that happens, we can start to envision a new purpose for our lives and it begins to make a difference. I, I want to encourage everyone watching online. I want to encourage everyone watching here, or it's here with us this morning. You know, I always tell people this. You know, I, I know the simple truth that
people don't go to church like they used to, but I also know this, it can make a difference. And I tell people, hey, if you're new to fame in life, give us one year. Go all in for one year. I mean, go to Bible studies, go to small groups, get involved and start serving. Go all in for one year and see if there's a difference in your life. And that's not just at Family Life. That's for any good church. There's a lot of good churches, but I thought Family Life. Listen, it's hard for Family Life to really help you if you only come once a month. If you come once every six weeks. Get involved. Start meeting people. Start serving. Start doing things. It will make a difference in your life. Would you stand with me today? Just take a, a moment and just allow the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart. How many of you here this morning, you know, just as I was speaking and the Holy Spirit just spoke something to your heart, something on the, in the process of reaching spiritual maturity, there's something that the Holy Spirit spoke to your heart that, that you need to really double down on, you need to really get involved with, there, there's one part of this Lord God, we, we thank you today. And Lord, the goal is we want to be Christ-like. Lord, the goal is we want to reach spiritual maturity. We don't want to stay babies in the Lord. Lord, we don't want to live the rest of our lives with, with the things that we're carrying on the inside of us. And Lord, today, the process was simple. You want us to really know you, to understand you, to have a personal, intimate relationship with you. And Lord, you want us to open our hearts to the Holy Spirit. And let him come in and heal the hurts. Lord, you want us to do And our purpose is all around us. It's everywhere we go. There's purpose for us at his church, in our families, in our communities. And God, you want us to use our spiritual maturity to be a blessing to others. God, I pray right now for those who really desire to grow spiritually. God, I pray you would help us just to become awake and alive in their hearts, God. Lord, I pray for those watching online. Hey, there's somebody that's watching online right now. And just as I was praying that, you said you, you still don't think you have a purpose, that you, you still don't think you have worth, that God could use you. I just want to speak to that this morning. That, that's a lie from the devil. Every one of us have purpose. Every one of us have gifts. Every one of us, I would love to talk with you. I'd love to pray for you. Because that, that's just absolutely not true. God, I just pray right now in Jesus' name. Lord, that your spirit is just awakening in us. And God, you're taking us on a journey so that we can be incredible husbands and fathers and mothers and daughters and wives. And God, we can be spiritually mature and be a blessing to those around us. God, I thank you for that. And Lord, I pray that you would help us in the process of taking people through this journey and getting them from step one to step two, step three, all the way to the make a difference part. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us this morning.